lose a meaning system like I did. Tried to put in the work to salvage what I could of it. Keep the good parts because there are objectively solid practices. My my own morality, I think, is, is pretty much based around the life and teachings of Jesus. Still, to this day. We aspire to become awakened beings, to live in harmony with the truth of life. From Vast Noodle Media, I'm Trent Bell. This is Knowing and Believing, a podcast about how we believe. Welcome back to the third installment of this series with Taylor Lang uh, on Knowing and Believing. I am your host, Trent Bell. Uh, Thank you for tuning in, either watching or listening as a podcast. Uh, We left off uh, session two or episode two with Taylor at the end of kind of a more academic breakdown of Taylor's deconstruction story. And now we're going back into the story form of where we left off uh, with you basically hitting rock bottom as far as your existential dread, loss of belief and everything else kind of uh, hit a low point after a lecture and a a realization of questions that you had that had been verbalized and everything else, and it was a very emotional moment for you, and you went to a very dark place. Yep. So take it away. At this point in the story, I'm not functioning very well. I start kind of reaching out, uh, you know, after a little while. I'm talking to my friends, my roommate's a really good friend of mine about this, and he's kind of had similar uh, questions and doubts. And I approached my brother about this. Um, I approached my cousin with some of these questions, um, particularly about just like how depressed I was about, you know, I don't understand what infinity means. I don't understand, like I'm not, I'm not sure what happens after we die kind of things. Uh, you know, all of these implications of like losing, like having that, oh my God, there is no God kind of moment. Right. Um, or at least, at least the kind of God that I once believed in is not God. Right. It's just a figment of my imagination. Right. Almost. So I'm talking with my brother and he's kind of moved into a more secular vein. Um, you know, for a while, I'm not really talking to anyone about it. And then, uh, after I talked to my brother, he's like, why don't you, uh, why don't you read Alan Watts? Um, and for those who don't know who Alan Watts is, uh, he's a, or he was kind of a, a preeminent figure in the new age spirituality movement. Uh, and he, he was, you know, he was brought up in, in Zen Buddhism and he was kind of a, a bit of an educator in the way of Zen and the philosophy of Zen Buddhism, mm-hmm. uh, to the West. Uh, so I read some Alan Watts and I talked to, uh, and, and I also got a little bit more into Buddhist spirituality because I wanted to know, you know, I knew that, that Buddhism didn't 100%, that Buddhism didn't require a God, but it was still a form of spirituality and it was still a, a form of, um, of building, building a meaning in life. Um, and I started talking to a few of the people in my, in David's lab and particularly in, in, I never talked to David specifically about this, but but one of the things that all of them in the lab mentioned um, was the idea of mindfulness, of taking yourself out of your head and out of these hard thoughts and really just appreciating the sensory input of the world and your subjective experience of it. I have such a hard time with that. Yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to it's hard to practice. Um, and so, so from multiple different directions, I had uh, the Buddhist kind of calls to meditation and mindfulness. I had this secular research that um, had to do with mindfulness and the ability to intentionally like do everything that you're doing, like it's your last moment on earth, uh, and really just trying to savor everything. And, you know, after a while of going through therapy and talking about this with my therapist, and talking about these new ideas with my therapist, I began generally reconstructing some semblance of a faith and being like, okay, 
there are some things we can't answer. There are some things that science kind of comes comes up short on in terms of uh, in, in in terms of imparting meaning. Right. Um, right. Like yeah. I've heard it um, said that you know science is a way of uh, defining objective facts, mm-hmm. and spirituality more so is a way of uh, finding meaning. Yep. Yeah. 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 So. I, so I did that and, and in addition, uh, I really dove into like the academic research on the, like I dove even more into the research on the academic study of religion and, and, you know, a bit on the neurology of it and on the psychology of it. And the evolutionary psychology of it, you know, as I'm practicing meditation, I'm slowly beginning to, uh, you know, as I'm, I'm trying to experience all of this and spirit experience all of my relationships and everything. I, I kind of made this intentional choice to have a frame shift of like, okay. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, a humanist philosophy of, um, you know, even if God's not making meaning, that doesn't mean meaning doesn't exist. Right. It, meaning exists to me. It exists to everyone. It's See, a I'm part not, of w- what it is to be human. I, I know and agree with that statement, but I'm not at a point of understanding how to emotionally accept it. That's like the weird thing for me. Like, yeah, there for me right now. There, there is no meaning. Meaning's just, just as made up as God. If there is no God, right? So, what's the use? You know, that's like the difficulty emotionally where I'm at right now, and I'm half of the time I'm just like trying to not think of that, and just like you got kids to love and feed. Yeah, <laughs> don't think about anything else. And but the problem right now for me is that anytime. I'm by myself or I have a moment, my mind is like a hundred miles an hour on that. Yeah. Just like I have no downtime. And I started trying to like meditate in the mornings last year. And there was one morning where something weird happened where there was a cricket outside. And like, I feel normally like I'm, plastered against one of those um Times square uh jumbotrons where the images are moving by them super fast mm-hmm. and the, like those images are all the thoughts that i can't con- not can't not control but they're just constantly going yep every kind of thought whatever you know just can't stop it and i was sitting there that morning just trying to just breathe and you know not not think and but not try and shame myself for thinking you know it's like this game and that cricket was out there and then all of a sudden instead of being like this on plastered on the outside of this cylinder where the all the thoughts are just constantly and i was like up against it like all of a sudden i went into the middle and it was like there was a separation between my consciousness and my thoughts all of a sudden yeah and they were out there and i was in the middle and that cricket was like playing the tune that did it i don't and it is so weird because like all of a sudden it's like the thoughts were traffic going by or something and i wasn't part of it and it was just a really calm you know there was no voice talking to me or anything like that it was just like really calm yeah and it's like you know the sofas that are like velvet that you can rub your hand all over them and you can all, you can like write your name in them. Yeah. You know, and then you write your hand across and then it's all gone. Mm-hmm. I felt like in that moment, my whole mind, it's like someone had just made all the velvet go the same direction and it was clean again. You know? Wow. That's quite the experience. Well, and I I found that I was really productive after that for like a few hours, and and I've never been able to get back to that same. Thing happening and I know I could probably do more of that if I were to be more regimented about it you know more consistent but I could completely experience that that mindfulness and just taking that time to 
uh, be conscious of your thoughts and to work with that. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting to me that I've never really thought before this, like, where do my thoughts come from and why are they constant? Like, why doesn't it just slow down? I have will, however you define it, and I have consciousness. So, uh, but the thoughts, they're like a third entity. Yeah. And it, to me, like meditation and finding that practice is a, a process of delineating those things. Yeah. It's like, all right, thoughts, I'm taking a break. You go over there. I'm still going to be over here and I'm still going to be conscious, but I'm not going to be involving the thoughts quite as much. It's, right. It's so weird to say now, but it's also so weird to think that I never thought about that. But yeah. So uh, it, what you're describing is uh, kind of interesting. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to pick at that experience to get what it was, um, if you're all right with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so were you, were you focusing on the cricket? I'm, I'm extremely auditory and visual. Yep. Um, extremely low reading comprehension. Okay. Extremely low. Like halfway through a paragraph, my mind's like running through a daisy field. Yeah. And I'm like, did I just read that? Um, most of the mornings, um, Sorry, what was your question again? Exactly. When you're <laughs> what during during this, you said that that a cricket was right. Was okay, going. so were you focused on that cricket? Most of the mornings, I can't help but hear the refrigerator motor in the house that we lived in, uh, or Route Nine, the road out there. Mm-hmm. But that morning, it was like September, I think, and the window was open, and the cricket was out there. I didn't intentionally focus on it, but it was just a. Burr, burr, and it was just it was just a really like it was all sudden like it was a weird thing yeah so depending on who you are um different styles of meditation work best which is probably why there are so many different types of meditation this is news to me honestly oh so because i mean meditation is of the devil in many religions ain't that the truth (laughs) um i go to yoga sometimes uh, and that helps take me out. Uh, and especially I go to hot yoga sometimes and that really like that kind of practice is really good at pulling you into your body and out of your mind mm. and focusing on the, the, the current moment. Cause you're in like a 98 to a hundred and something degree room and you're doing pretty, I mean, it's not super rigorous exercise, but it's, it's substantial exercise. And, uh, and so that's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good way of taking you out of your mind and into your body. Right. That's, you know, it's a, it's, it's quite a trip and it's pretty enjoyable. So that's, that's kind of the, the, one of the philosophies behind yoga is that you're bringing your consciousness out of your head and into your body so that you're mm. experiencing, um, so like when, I, when I'm in the yoga studio and the instructor says downward dog, I'm, I'm moving, I'm experiencing the full range of motion and I'm experiencing this, you know, because the yoga studio is so hot, like I'm experiencing the sweat coming out of every pore of my body and it's like I have no time to think. Right. Because the, the, the brain is entirely focused on trying to keep the body intact and keep along with everybody else. See, I would self-medicate in that way. <laughs> like in times of, like I used to live like right over there at the top of a hill and there was a really steep road. Yep. And I knew that I would push myself to, to some physical exertion level where it would clear my mind in that way. Yeah. And that was extremely therapy. It's, you know, it's different than yoga, obviously, but it was a physical process of, I knew that I could go and push myself so hard that I could not think Mm -hmm. about all the stuff that was bugging me or whatever else. And it was really therapeutic. And the thing that sucks is I can't run anymore because my right foot is like, not going to do it. (laughs) So, so, uh, there's there in terms of like regular, meditation practices there's transcendental meditation which i'm not entirely familiar with there's uh what i originally started with is called passage meditation which is where you take a um 
where you take a, a passage usually of a, uh, a sacred text and you, um, or like a, a text written by some sort of a mystic or a poet and you repeat it over and over slowly in your mind. So you're giving your mind something to do. And so the Christians could get behind that one. I as started as it as, it was... an, as an identified Christian. Yeah. So usually what I started with was I started with the Lord's Prayer. Right. It's very easy. And it's a very, when you look at it in a, in a very particular way, what the Lord's Prayer is really saying is, um, forgive what I did yesterday, help me to stay in the moment today, give me all I need for today, and please take care of tomorrow so I don't have to worry about it. Right. So there's, um, and that's like, I'm sure any theologian would love to debate me on that. And I would not love to debate them because I'm not a theologian. So, but that's just kind of how I, how I see it. Um, uh, and I use the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, let me be an instrument of thy will where there is anger. Let me sow peace and on and on and so forth. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty long prayer, but it's a, it's a prayer yeah. that you're focusing on and you're saying slowly over and over and over in your head. So you're giving your brain something to do. And you're also, while you're doing that, you're training your brain to have those feelings and to try to rebuke feelings of anger and jealousy. Oh, you're kind of gener- intentionally generating feelings to, right. uh, to kind of learn how to control your emotions in a yep. way and, and be more, be more positive. Right. It's a good, like I can feel generally around September, I work myself to death and I can feel like mild depression. Mm-hmm. Like, Same. like anything I think about doing feels like it's going to be too much work. I'm just like, ah. I wouldn't call it depression because I've seen people with depression and that's yeah. real. And this is like well, something that I can stay, it's very mild, but I can stay above by staying very active physically and just taking care of myself. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, that practice is extremely valuable. So uh, I started going back to the gym and exercise is extremely good for your brain. Yeah. Um, helps you release stress in a healthy way. You know, I haven't been in a while, but I'm, trying to get back in the in the swing of things so all of these practices combined helped me come to a sense of peace there's not a I can't really think of a defining moment when I um like there's no like grand mystical experience or anything but generally over time of of doing these practices I began to see the color in the world again I began to appreciate my relationships more And I began to pull myself into the present moment of acknowledging the very fact that my consciousness exists on this plane and that I am able to look down at my hands and it seems like a miracle. Like on a, um, another Binghamton University professor wrote a book called Excellent Beauties, Um, you know, the unnaturalness of science and the naturalness of religion basically talking about how there are so many things about the universe that oh, are kind of crazy a good statement because yeah. like science is pretty unnatural yeah like we you, like there there are things about the world that are crazy right but like studying something in an objective manner like that is like the last natural thing that would just happen yeah but by doing that you discover so much about nat- nature natural laws all of that yeah and like religion and spirituality is more of the natural way of just understanding meaning and controlling society or right. behavior. Yeah. That's an interesting statement. So, you know, on the, on the back book, it's a really good book. I would, re- I would recommend what, reading it. What is it, it again? It's called, uh, called Excellent Beauties by Eric Diedrich. I think it was written in 2015 or published in 2015. On the, ba- on the back flap cover, surprisingly, and I was very surprised to see this, uh, Deepak Chopra had uh, reviewed it. And he wrote on the cover, cover flap, this, just reading this book was a spiritual experience. If you aren't constantly surprised by the fact that you exist, your humanity is not entirely complete. Right. And so, like, I am constantly surprised that I exist and am able, and, and I introduced, um, in addition to, you know, mindfulness practice, I introduced, you know, I, I was not particularly 
I didn't actively practice gratitude. I, yeah, I'm not there yet. I'm pretty. I'm a pretty cold fish when it comes <laughs> to stuff like that. I got to work on that. So I. So I started actively. So and I just kind of started. Um, even if I didn't mean it at, at first, and right. I don't you fake I, it till you make exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> just the just the repetition of it. Right. So like, I would get surprised that I exist. Like, wow, I exist. The world exists, and you know I can experience it. And I'm thankful for that. Right. And then as you build up that gratitude and as you build up that neural pathway, and even if, and I will also freely admit, it might just be a quirk of neurology. It still doesn't change the fact that my subjective experience of reality can be breathtaking and magical. One of my therapists said, she was talking about the Vatican, or a speech that the Vatican astronomer, he's this MIT trained astrophysicist and one of the thing he he kind of started out with, with like i believe it was like a history of the astrophysicists of the the vatican and what he was trying to get at was don't ask me if i think god exists the question is irrelevant to me me doing my work in trying to understand the universe is how i worship and how i worship this existence and how i express my gratitude for being able to experience reality. Right, right. And so that's kind of how I now see myself. I'm, I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm an evolutionary social scientist who studies human groups and how they function and how they cooperate. That is my form, you know, of quote unquote worship. That's what I do. I try to uncover more mysteries about the universe and I try to make the lives make my my own life and the lives of others better and so that's just like that's ultimately the point that i've come to now and and that doesn't mean that every day is sunshine and rainbows existence is not exclusively positive Ex- existence encompasses all of the range of experiences from suffering to joy. And without having the suffering, you wouldn't be able to, you know, and this is another, another platitude that's often expressed is you wouldn't, you know, you can't enjoy the sun if you don't have the rain. And, uh, and that also negatively, puts rain into perspective because rain serves a purpose. Right. Water is the majority of what we are. And, uh, and without that rainfall, we wouldn't be able to live and sustain ourselves and we wouldn't be able to live and sustain ourselves without the sun. So all, both the rain and the sun makes us who we are. And so in order to, in order to fully experience that, you have to embrace like you have to, you have to embrace that dark night of the soul right. that you go through, hmm. because it it it's a part of it's a part of your story, right. and it's part of my story, and it's a part of how you know, and it's a part of the story that, um, like my view of the Bible now, is this collection of stories that are very much the same. You know, when I look at the stories of all the major characters, Moses, Paul, Peter, Jesus to some extent, but he, we don't actually know if he went through a dark night of the soul because we don't know about like half of his life, which would be nice to, to get oh, those. Gethsemane, his, they would call that, wouldn't they? What? They'd call the Garden of Gethsemane experience for him a pretty dark night. Wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't that's, they, yeah, that's a fair, okay, that's a fair. I mean, I mean. The the Adventist interpretation of it, I can say at least, was that, you know, Christ just, they're saying that Christ just couldn't see the Father through that. Yeah. He couldn't see beyond it. And so, right. you know. It's all part of, when you lose a meaning system like I did, mm-hmm. um, I've just tried to put in the work to salvage what I could of it. And try mm. to tie it into everything else and, you know, kind of keep the good parts and be able to explain the parts that, um, and try to explain all of it. 
because there are um, objectively solid practices uh, from that cultural symbolic meaning system yeah. that so the, yeah so it, it 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 instilled in me a morality that still um, is mostly intact yeah and it uh, you know with with some minor changes not minor pretty major changes but all in all, you know, my, my own morality, I think is, is pretty much based around the life and teachings of Jesus still to this day. I mean, I can honestly say that, you know, what's really interesting. Have you watched life of Brian? No. It's a, do you know the movie at all? It's a Monty Python that it, it's, it's kind of like their mockery of religion. Mm-hmm. And it's based around the time that Christ was around. Mm-hmm. They'd set out to basically mock religion by making fun of christ Mm. so they did their research and they're like can't really make fun of this guy right pretty solid yeah i mean the supernatural claims i mean you can't really prove it but right this is a pretty solid dude yeah what are we gonna do we can't you can't make fun of that really because and so they're like well why don't we just make fun of religion and make up a guy that they thought was you know the messiah that wasn't yeah and we'll make fun of the religion through that. Mm -hmm. And it was just interesting to me that like, here's these guys that are, you know, mostly probably just secular and they're like, oh, this will be a laugh. And then they go and look at the life of Christ and they're like, hmm, yeah, he's a pretty pretty upstanding guy. (laughs) And it's funny in the movie, you see Christ in the background, Mm -hmm. like teaching and at the, like the Sermon on the Mount or whatever. And, and like Brian, who the movie's about is like over here and he's just kind of like, hmm, and walks away. And then like, someone's just like, there's the Messiah, you know? And, and so they all like go after Brian and it turns into this big, crazy thing. Right. But it's, it was interesting like that. Yeah. I, I keep coming back to like the life of Christ is, you know, a great thing to base your life of the teachings of Christ are great. Gandhi would say the same thing, but he'd have some criticism of Christians, you know, yep. which I think we all have. So where where do you find community now? And do you have ev- any evolutionary academic perspective on why I don't like groups? <laughs> and and like my, re- my all-out reject, like it feels like you may be... F- felt like you lost something when you disassociated mm-hmm. with a church group. Yep. To me, it was a, uh, <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Like, I don't want to go back. I don't right. long to go there. I, I feel a spiritual inclination and a desire to know truth and find truth and a connection to mystery or AKA God. Mm-hmm but I don't want anything to do with the group. Yeah. Like, what's with that? <laughs> what so, evolutionary purpose does that serve? So, um, so in response to your first question, uh, I am very tightly involved with my graduate cohort um, here in Maine. They're like the best people I know. You know, we've, we've been through a lot and we 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 talk and joke and cook and eat and drink and be merry and uh and also have you know deeply philosophical and and intellectual talks so i'm i'm able to find community uh and i had other forms of community that weren't in the church uh my cousins and i are still exceptionally close um my brother and I are very tight and I have a lot of friends that I, I call on all the time for community. I'm able to, to pick my own faith community now in a way, uh, or which might be a strange thing to hear for someone who's, you know, actually in a faith community. Right. Um, but my faith community is who I make my faith community. And I, you know, I, I have a r- relatively uh, difficult to categorize faith at this point. Um, but I still have these, you know, spiritual and religious conversations 
and intellectual conversations that I, that I used to have, that youth, youth group used to have with different subjects and, um, and with different people. And so I've, I've found many groups that have been able to accept me pretty much for, for just who I am. Um, and are, are able to offer critiques of me and kind of guide me in different directions. Uh, if I'm, you know, you know, both intellectually and morally and, and able to challenge my own, my own preconceptions and my own axioms, right. but do it in a way that they don't feel like my, like I have to be saved. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's it's still its own different f- uh, priority value system and belief system. Mm. You know that that we are we are all searching truth through objective means here, and intellectual approach to things is of great value. Mm-hmm. Where you know faith communities are are uh, uh, different, um, but just as valid in a way but difficult when you get into uh if you're in that community and then you start to see things differently at all you you're 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 very much an offense to the people you're involved with and it's right and it's a very much a re- relationship ending thing in many ways luckily uh i never had that many <laughs> sounds like a horrible thing to say but i never had that many I either just didn't have that many friends <laughs> or like uh, I'm just close. I'm very close to very few people. Yeah. I'm just very introverted. You kind of, yeah, that's what I was so, going to Like mention. a lot of the connections I had, I haven't really lost those. Even like in the Adventist faith, they're all still very gracious with me. And yeah. I'm, and I, I would say I'm discussing and saying a, a lot of things that a lot of them are comfortable talking about and discussing anyways. Right. So I have not luckily uh, experienced like rejection or shame for questioning or going down any of these roads. Right. So that I, that anyone would say to my face anyways. <laughs> so right. I, you know, I really appreciate that. And I've been able to maintain what, uh, relationships I have, but I've never, I've never been able to figure out my ability or lack of ability to, uh, be involved in a community. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that might've been that we moved so much growing up and we were constantly in this secluded community even further of Adventism. But then even within that, we were secluded into our only our family unit because as a pastor, which my dad was for Mm -hmm. a lot of when I was growing up, you couldn't make yourself truly vulnerable to your congregation because you, you you know, there was, there was boundaries you'd have to set up where you were Mm -hmm. the pastor, you know, and then this is me reading into that. Maybe my dad was extremely vulnerable with his community and all that. I don't know. Um, but you had to set boundaries. You were, you were not just a pastor, you were administrator, you were a right. leader, blah, blah, blah. You had to keep up appearances, you know? So who are you actually going to sit down with and say, you know, like share a beer and say like, I don't, I'm having some doubts, you know, who's a pastor going to talk to about that? You can get fired if you <laughs> it's talk your to entire livelihood is based on you know. It, yeah. So it's it's a hard thing, and and I don't really quite know how to grow community now or even value community. So I've I've got to figure that out, and I've got to figure out how to accept meaning. So yeah, um, I think that um, my my own estrangement from my faith community, I think, was buffered by the fact that I had a pretty well, you know, in our, we, I, I had a pretty well established community outside of the faith. In our society today, um, at least in, in many contexts, um, in my context especially, we're able to be a part of multiple groups. Right. And right. so I, I personally am, am, I would also classify myself as an introverted person 
um, in the fact that I feel like I have to expend energy to be around people and don't feed off the energy of others. Mm. How do you feel in situations like this? Are you like exhausted after this kind of thing or are you more exhausted after a group interaction? Depends on, um, depends on the group and yeah. depends on the one-on-one -on -one interaction. So like right. right now, right now, I mean, this um, is a pretty high horsepower conversation yeah. just because of them like accessing all the mental stuff. But for me, socially and emotionally being in a group, like I'm constantly thinking like you guys are talking about minutia. This is not important. We need to figure out what's going on with the universe. I got to go. <laughs> there is <laughs> a literally. Yeah. So there there is um, there's a book called Kissed by Fire. And. It deals with the phenomenon of like the archetypal pioneer pilgrim, um, the 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 trailblazer, so to speak, um, and I think the the evolutionary roots behind it. So like, uh, I don't know if the 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 way this came came about was uh, I was in class in one of David's classes, at like a large evolutionary lecture. And, uh, I, I brought up like the point that a lot of cultural innovators also happen to be crazy <laughs> and, and maybe burn out and die young. Yeah. So, so yeah. in, they don't get the social cues because they just don't have time for it just, <laughs> in a way. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. um, uh, so you have people like, um, a good example, the, the example I used was Jimi Hendrix. He, yeah. he just revolutionized the way you use the guitar. And, but he also did a lot of acid and ended up dying right. when he was like 27. Like the degree at which he was open to experience, like created these incredible things. Yeah. But also like anything, he was open to every drug and everything else experience. Yeah. And so it just put him, you know, and, and there's also... I often see uh, creative and introverted people in terms of cameras as mm -hmm. having a really wide aperture, like all the lights coming in. Mm -hmm. And it can be overwhelming um, just because there's so much light hitting that digital sensor. And right. it's just, I, and I do this with a really wide aperture, you'll have a very shallow depth of field mm -hmm. as in what's in focus. Yep. Like, I'm sure I wear a lot of people out because I'm constantly talking about like, do we actually have free will? Is there a God? Blah, 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 you know? And I'm just focused on this one thing and it's so hard for me to focus on anything else and like all this light's coming in, but I just wear out, mm -hmm. you know, and I can get real just like disconnected. Right. Whereas my wife, like she can be in a noisy room and it doesn't bother her. Right. Like the kids will run and scream and destroy. And she's just like, like nothing's wrong. <laughs> and I'm yeah. just like, eh. and to me, she's got this incredibly tiny aperture of information coming in. She's extremely, extremely limited at like what she's doing and, yeah. and focused and not much light comes in, but she can handle it all. Everything's in focus with a tiny aperture. Like mm. it's just all good. Like so. yeah, it's uh, it's you know some point some people are uh, born with a, a a predisposition to be able to um, intentionally focus and kind of choose what they're focusing right. on, and uh, and that is and and since all parts of the brain are kind of interworking together, um, the parts of your unconscious that are making the decisions of what to present to your conscious mind um, are are much more able to tune out the like the cacophony that's happening around so you. I was born without that. Yeah, so <laughs> everything so, comes in right. So like if you're you're very able to like you know very easily distracted by the big pictures mm. and not very easy to. I'm the same way. Um, really? Oh yeah. And, and, and it gets me into trouble academically because I'm like, I have this idea for a project. And then my advisor would be like, great. Did you finish the one you were already working on? Yeah. And be like, mm, But this no. is a really good idea. <laughs> right. So, um, so, you know, but you can, um, 
there are there are mindfulness and focusing techniques uh, that have been psychologically parsed out um, through the literature to increase your aptitude to focus on certain things. Yeah, I'm going to have to spend some time eventually working on that and developing, I think, uh, a mental practice and just a discipline of disconnecting from the things that are incredibly meaning like uh, uh what's the not esoteric but like i have to just dwell in the like just playing in a mud puddle with the kids mm -hmm. stop thinking about the universe for a minute and just you know enjoy the mystery and the you know the simple here here's a here's a way you can do that um that sometimes i've uh i've employed recognizing that the universe is not just out there. It's also right here. Right. So in that playing, in, in the action of playing with, in, that, in the mud puddle with your kids, you're still exploring the universe and you're still exploring the uh, possibilities that it much has. truth there. Yeah. And you're, you're able to, you know, you're not going to necessarily learn objectively whether or not there's a God by playing with your kids in the mud puddle. But there's there's definitely some data points in there and there's yeah. some truth in there and there's analogies in there. And, and there's your ability to just feel be it. present and, and and have that connection with uh with your children that is in its own way exploring the bigger picture. Right. And not even necessarily in an objective scientific way. It's just you're experiencing something about what it means to be a father and what it means to be a human. And with that segue, we should wrap up because <laughs> that ties back into the Wesleyan quadrilateral, quad, quadrilateral of experience yep. being part of belief. And I do have kids I need to go see. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, this has been a really, really uh, enlightening, informative, and helpful conversation for me to, Good, to be able to talk to someone that's gone through a very similar experience in many ways uh, and who can give me some kind of theory and objective data and everything else on a lot of the reasons for a lot of the stuff that I've been going through and and kind of related to yours and i really appreciate it thanks for coming all the way down you're very and, welcome uh, it was my been, pleasure this was a lot of fun i'm glad yeah i'm glad you asked me to do this it's been really good thank you so much um so uh taylor lang uh do you do you have like a website or anything else where you're putting your work out there yet or so uh not me personally well I, okay so i can um so I do have a Twitter mm -hmm. that I, I uh, will occasionally post um, information on cultural evolution, the evolution of religion and local food systems and cooperation. Cool. Um, and uh, I will don't have my Twitter handle on hand. So um, Trent can post It'll that be in, in the, the comments notes down there. Yeah. And um, uh, and we our lab has a website called localfoodscience.com mm -hmm. right yeah. dot org I'm sorry localfoodscience.org sorry Tim and uh, the uh, you can go there to learn about all of our research on um, food sustainability and food cooperation and uh, and learn about the work that we're doing and get in contact with uh, anyone on our team Again, thanks so much. Thanks, uh, everyone, for listening or tuning in. Um, and uh, tune back in next week. And thank you so much again for coming down. It's been You're awesome. very welcome. It's been my pleasure, Trent. Cool.